America was shocked by his first space disaster. What happened the day Apollo 1 caught fire at the Cape? For NASA's Apollo program, the objective was simple. Demonstrate America's preeminence in space travel, especially over its competition, the Soviet Union. In some of our recent videos, we've spoken about some of the missteps made in the Soviet space program. But the United States made some fatal errors during the race for space supremacy as well. Space travel is never without risks. And as we're about to see, Apollo 1 serves as a stark reminder of the dangers astronauts face in the quest for knowledge. What really happened to Apollo 1? Why wasn't there a rescue attempt? Join us as we shine new light on one of the most gripping and heart-wrenching stories in space exploration history. When NASA first announced plans for the Apollo program, it was met with fresh excitement and enthusiasm. Humans were going to achieve a feat never before seen. Conceived during President Eisenhower's administration, the flames of excitement burned brighter when his successor, President John F. Kennedy, promised to put Americans on the moon and also bring them back to Earth safely. The Apollo program had to outdo not just NASA's preceding projects, Mercury and Gemini, but also whatever the Soviet Union had in mind at the time. The space race was at fever pitch, and an obvious battle line had been drawn. And unfortunately for them, the United States was losing badly. The Soviet Union had been racking up lots of firsts. They launched the first man-made object and satellite, Sputnik, although it was quickly followed by America's own satellite, the Explorer 1. The taste of second wasn't good enough. The space race was never just about flinging objects, animals or people into space. No, it was much deeper. The space race served as a means of showing which nation had the better technology, the better military firepower and, by extension, the better political economic system. So, following the launch of Explorer 1, President Eisenhower signed NASA into existence. Yet it wasn't enough. The Soviet Union hit back with a double feature, launching the first space probe to reach the moon in 1959 and the first man to orbit Earth. Again, America came in second. Things had to change and quickly if they were serious about winning this space race. In 1961, NASA saw a dramatic 500% increase in its budget and things started moving rapidly. Why wouldn't they? Kennedy had been elected with a campaign that had been centered around winning the space race and essentially one-upping the Soviet Union. He was going to make America first, period. He committed the current equivalent of $164 billion to NASA and failure was not an option. America would be first to the moon or they'd die trying. Enter Apollo 1, a goal the moon was set and resources were made available. There was, however, one problem. What do you pack on a journey to where no one has ever been? NASA scientists had to find a way to send humans to the moon as safely as possible and at the lowest cost possible with the technology available. What kind of spacecraft would be able to achieve this and how? With several options to choose from, NASA scientists settled on a lunar orbit rendezvous. LOR. For this method, a launch vehicle carrying a command and support module would be launched to the Moon's orbit. Then a smaller two-astronaut lunar module would be flown to the Moon's surface and back to the command module before it was disposed of. Easy. North American Aviation was contracted to build both modules and the launch vehicle, the Saturn V, while the Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation built the lunar module. The teams completed construction of the spacecraft and there was a detailed plan to get it to the moon. Now it was time to test it. NASA manager Abe Silverstein named the mission Apollo after the Greek god of light, music and the sun. He said it was because he felt Apollo riding his chariot across the sun was appropriate to the grand scale of the proposed program. No argument there. For the first Apollo test, a three-man crew was to fly the spacecraft, dubbed AS-204, 
short for Apollo Saturn, with a command and service module to Earth's orbit. The AS-204 was intended to test launch operations, ground tracking and control infrastructure, as well as the performance of the Apollo Saturn launch assembly. The astronauts for this test mission were selected by Deke Slayton, Director of Flight Crew Operations, Virgil Gus Grissom, the second American to fly in space and the second to do it twice, was selected as command pilot. Ed White, famous for being the first American to perform a space walk, was selected as the mission's senior pilot. For the third seat, Don Eisel was originally selected, but two shoulder dislocations during training forced the young astronaut to sit the mission out. This created an opening for Roger Chaffee, a naval officer and aeronautic engineer. The star-studded crew had been properly trained for the test mission. If anything, they were more than capable, even for a mission of this magnitude. So much so that they sensed trouble a mile away. The command module, or Block 1 module, for the mission seemed off. For starters, Block 1 had been designed and built before the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan was conceived. This made it incapable of performing the necessary maneuvers required for the moon landing mission. It was also the largest and most complicated module at the time, and when the team inspected it, they thought it had too many parts that were highly inflammable and, as such, very unsafe. They went as far as taking a parody crew portrait to express their misgivings about the module and spacecraft's general design. Their concerns did not fall on deaf ears. Joseph Shi, who was in charge of managing the design of the modules, ordered North American Aviation to remove all flammables from the modules, or at least as much as they could, without impacting the overall design. There were several other problems with the spacecraft as well, but they were all supposedly patched up, and the spacecraft was deemed fit for testing. Like a warning of things to come, one of the backup pilots for the test mission, Wally Shearer, warned Grissom that while he couldn't point to one thing wrong with the spacecraft, he felt very uneasy about it. On January 27, 1967, Grissom, White and Chaffee made their way into the command module of AS-204 and prepared for launch. Test missions can go wrong in the blink of an eye, and this was not an exception. As soon as the crew was strapped to their seats, things began spiralling out of control. Grissom was first to notice a strange odour in the module. He said it smelled like sour buttermilk, and the countdown was paused for investigation of this odour. Nothing was found, so after about an hour, the countdown resumed. After countdown came hatch installation, and after sealing the hatches, the air in the cabin was replaced with pure oxygen at very high pressure, as per instructions from NASA. When a problem with Grissom's microphone caused a second delay, that should have been the cue for the crew to abandon the mission. But Grissom wasn't going to allow fear to obstruct this extremely important mission. The countdown was still on hold when it happened. Grissom was complaining about the problem with his microphone and communications when a sudden electrical surge was recorded in one of the AC connections. What followed would be etched in the memories of millions of Americans and people all over the world. Grissom was the first to yell, Fire! Chaffee confirmed it and the crew began attempts to escape what was now an inferno. Ground control tried communicating with the crew, but there was confusion, a problem with the radios, and an evident struggle by the team trying to escape being burned to death. The 100% oxygen and the number of flammable materials still remaining in the module offered a quick burning fuel supply for fire. The situation got even worse. The heat, smoke and lack of adequate equipment to rescue the crew barred any form of rescue attempt. There was also the possibility of the command module exploding and killing anyone brave enough to go close to it. The fire eventually caused the walls of the module to rupture, releasing some of the pressure within it. The majority of the oxygen was used up and replaced with atmospheric air, effectively putting out the fire, but also filling the cabin with high levels of carbon monoxide, thick smoke and soot as it cooled. When pad workers finally made it to the hatch, 
It took about five minutes to open, as it was extremely complicated. When they were in, they were greeted with an unforgettable sight. Grissom was on the floor, his melted spacesuit pinning him to the cabin. White had tried escaping through the hatch, and his charred remains were found just beneath it, and Shafi was found still strapped to his chair. It took over an hour to remove the remains of the astronauts. Strangely, it wasn't the extensive burns that killed the astronauts, it was the massive amount of carbon monoxide that filled the boxy module that was their undoing. All three had died from cardiac arrest following inhalation of high concentrations of carbon monoxide. You can imagine the backlash all parties involved received after this disaster. A thorough investigation followed. Investigators discovered that the wiring inside the space capsule was covered with Teflon, which resulted in an electrical short that caused the fire. Teflon is flame resistant, however, the Teflon coated wires that were used for the command module were readily perforated and destroyed. The review board noted five areas of concern the spaceship atmosphere, flammable materials, electrical components, hatch design, and gross mismanagement. These elements had a direct bearing on the accident's cause. The emergency services, slow reaction time, and the impossibility of a rescue for the Apollo 1 crew. The Apollo program and every other space mission was affected by the disaster of Apollo 1. We may never have reached the moon if adjustments to safety protocols hadn't been implemented in the wake of the Apollo 1 incident. The valiant commitment of astronauts Grissom, White, and Shafi helped pave humanity's route to space exploration. When Armstrong and Aldrin finally made it to the moon, an Apollo 1 patch was placed on the surface, immortalizing the crew forever. Do you think the casualties of Apollo 1 were an inevitable part of our journey to the moon? Let us know in the comments.